Hi and welcome to The Long Game, a podcast by Macau Group where we sit down and have raw conversations with talented specialists and people who are passionate about what they do in the built environment. My name is Kelvin Moravi and I lead the team here at Macau. Check us out at macau.com.au to learn more. That's m a k a o.com.au. This is volume 1 where we explore the ins and outs of energy efficiency in buildings. Today's episode features Nick Bishop, an electrical engineer by training and the founder of Hero Software. Hero is an energy modeling tool that helps energy assessors to quickly simulate and optimize thermal performance in apartments and multi-dwelling projects. Leave the door to your mind open and enjoy the conversation. Thanks for making time today, Nick. Uh, it's been a few months uh, since we started having this conversation and talking about uh, sitting down and having a chat over the internet. There's also the geographical gap because you're in Queensland. Yeah, Sunshine Coast, hinterland. We're based um, yeah. behind behind the Sunshine Coast, up in the mountains, or well, not really mountains, in the hills. Yes. Yeah. Maybe just to begin with, I think it would be best for you to just share about yourself, or just give an overview of maybe your professional background and your role. Yeah, sure. I was trained as an electrical engineer about 15 years ago, and I suppose in electrical engineering, there's a lot of software. You know, we'd go with the software guys for most of that degree, so I always had a bit of software in my professional background, but originally it was more into building computers and those kind of things. My old man ran an electronics company and I was doing soldering and PCB design, computers and stuff like that. And working there, doing repairs and soldering and assembly. And a lot of the hardware part. Yeah, the hardware part and then a bit of firmware, which is like the software of a machine. Worked there for a few years at my old man's company in Brisbane. And at some point, me and my partner, Michelle, moved to London. Lived in London, travelled around Europe, did a bit of work in London as an engineer, more in the building services sector. I think it was a two-year visa where you like travel for a year, work for a year. So that was great. Big city, lots of great places to explore. But that was when I started getting into in my yeah, early 20s, renewable energy and eco design and passive solar architecture and starting to discover all of that, which quickly caught my fancy. So I started exploring that as an avenue for applying my engineering skills. I was getting a bit, I don't know, maybe a bit jaded with a lot of the electrical engineering work with, say, the mining or whatever, these kind of industries. So some other opportunity to express myself where I, you know, fit a bit better at yeah. that stage. It sounds like it was a little bit of a creative outlet as well. Absolutely. I don't really like that term creative because it never gets applied to engineers like us, but I consider engineers quite creative. We do solve things in different ways. I find engineering quite a creative profession. Well, it expresses my type of creativity. My creativity is in Excel spreadsheets or something <laughs> like that. Perverse creativity. There's uh, an element of creativity, although some domains are a little bit more conservative. In, in most cases, every problem tends to be quite different. You know, every project tends to have very different parameters that you have to deal with. So I believe that there is an element of creativity that comes with problem, problem solving. Definitely. And I think as a ESD consultant, that's, you know, part of that holistic aspect of being an ESD consultant who's always in other people's sectors or silos, talking to mechanical engineers, architects, builders, structural engineers, you're in everybody's spots, trying to connect teams and add your input and that kind of stuff. So that is a creative process of managing people trying to look for opportunities across these sectors. It's an interesting field of work. And so, yeah, I started getting into that over there, doing a few courses on energy modelling or building simulation while we were yeah, living in London. And then we moved back to Australia. We moved to Melbourne and stayed in Melbourne for about 10 years. And that was where I yeah, did my Master's in Sustainable Energy at RMIT, which was good fun to meet some like-minded people and connect into that industry, started doing piecemeal work around that industry green loans, a few of these kind of programs that were run at that stage. And I started working in a consultancy outfit in Melbourne, Sustainable Built Environments, as an ESD consultant there and started getting into the heavy energy modelling stuff. I started to enjoy, but also Green Star projects and NatHerz energy ratings, daylight modelling, all of that engineering we do as ESD consultants. And they were a specialist ESD consultancy, so not tied to a building services team or a 
architectural team, which is an interesting perspective, your own outfit of being able to bring an independence and not under another team perspective that can happen. And then after a few years working there, me and a few colleagues split off and formed a little mini ESD consultancy called Urban Digester with Ben Cooter and Imchu. And we wanted to explore what kind of services we could take for ESD consultancy, more creative or interesting perspective, deliver different value propositions to our clients. But it was great fun. We were also doing a bit of architectural design and build. So they were interesting years running our business for the first time. We had, <laughs> as you always do, which I discovered then, I always thought starting a business would be um, my own boss. I can do my own hours, but <laughs> quickly realized I'm more of an, a workaholic when I'm working for myself than for anyone else to this day. Um, started doing a lot of R&D projects that become inspiration for where Hero Software became of scripts and optimizations on the end of other energy modeling packages. It started spending a lot of my time developing tools to try to turn what is a consulting service into more of a product to streamline what value you're delivering, try to make it as a tool so you can deliver it quickly and cost-effectively better. Mm -hmm. uh, standardized outputs and then when i left that consultancy probably i don't know seven years ago we moved out to country victoria a little town called castlemaine which we were there for a year or two which was awesome I discovered my love for living out in regional australia i mean it's only an hour away from melbourne so it's not too regional but simpler uh, life a simpler life i did a bit of building there built my own little tiny house which is good when you're behind the computer screen all day to try and get that balance getting that practical side of it a bit of practical side of things like understanding the construction process i think is also a good part of anyone's journey in this sector yeah, it was good fun and then when we had our first kid after a year or two we moved back to where i was born and raised Brisbane, and then we subsequently moved up here to Mullaney. So we're on a couple of acres here in the, the hinterland and trying to get that balance of working and you know, life. Yeah. And I guess that's a, a lot more suitable in the current environment where almost everyone is warming up to the idea of working remotely more and more. When we moved to Castlemaine, I realized how easy it could be to remote, not having to go into Melbourne for a four-hour design team meeting. You could just have a 15-minute conversation, solve everything, and you'd be done. So it was much more efficient in many respects. I think it's a good thing that people are considering the regions as a better option these days. My partner certainly prefer it out here than Horses for Courses. <laughs> just a very quick question about your journey in the EST space. Just curious... Uh, from your observation, are there differences that stand out in terms of how the process is approached in the UK compared to Australia? I think they were certainly more along the way in both a regulatory aspect as well as uh, the voluntary aspect in quite a few areas of sustainable built environments in the UK when I was there. Energy modelling was a common section of every building services company. They were using it in quite mature, complex fashion rather than just minimum compliance. There was a lot more options for training in various things there too. Did a bit of training over in the UK and Europe. Uh, and then coming back to Australia, certainly Melbourne had more going on. And when we moved back to Queensland, it's interesting to see also the difference between those two states. And I think that's down to climate a little bit. Melbourne being colder, I'm up in Queensland. I've got a, a jumper on, but the doors are all wide open and it's the middle of June. <laughs> Passive design is relatively easy when you've got a climate that's between 20 and 30 degrees most of the year to Melbourne. So maybe that's a, a driving factor there. The passive design aspect of ESD that always becomes the focus rather than appliance energy efficiency or solar PV, which is an, an easier angle than design and architecture. Yeah, uh, and they're building envelope as well. Yeah, that's right. So it does seem to be a bit more mature in Victoria than since moving back to Queensland, less uh, telling people what I did as an ESD consultant, even people in the architectural space hadn't heard of that role as much. There certainly are 
uh, firms up here who do that and do it well, but mm. less well known across the industry. And th there's something you mentioned when comparing the two countries, Australia and the UK. You said that a little bit further ahead from both mandatory sl slash compliance perspective, but also voluntary. How do you draw the distinction between the two? Like voluntary, as in what you're doing as an engineer to make your project better. Minimum standards can sometimes get into your brain that's your target just because someone's legally put a floor on what the performance or the requirement of something is yeah doesn't mean that's your logical target it's not the best uh, practice if there was no target where would you target and that's a kind of discussion between client yourself your skills the technologies these kind of things and I think it was less rigid in terms of targeting that minimum there. It was more, mm -hmm. we just do this as part of process of some of those additional aspects here that sometimes don't get delivered. Mm -hmm. um, as an ESD consultant, I was always quite conscious of that. I think we shouldn't be relying on minimum standards. We have a really important part to play to convince our clients to go beyond those for so many good reasons. Mm. And if you can convey those reasons, a lot of your clients will come with you mm. because it's a no brainer in a whole bunch of aspects, whether it's financial, environmental, or the building's longevity and the health of the people inside it. But as you, you know, you're aware, it's a very complex discussion and it's hard in an hour to drop that on someone and get them to change their direction for their project. But I think we that's a good target for every ESD consultant or sustainability consultant to try and have a go at is to see what you can take them a bit beyond mm -hmm. uh, where they were perhaps going to go. Um, in, in the end of my ESD consulting, that was where we were going with a lot of our projects. We were taking them to uh, all electric zero emission projects as a benchmark. Can we go there? This is you know, seven years ago or whatever, where it was a bit harder to do some of those things, lack of technology in, in the marketplace. But we, a lot of clients are happy if you can champion those things for them and make it possible. They like the idea and then you need to be the guy to deliver it, I suppose. Yeah. Nice. Before moving on to the next question, I'm just curious from the, the many years that you've been in this space, like you mentioned, in some areas in Queensland, but across the nation as well, ESD might not be a well understood field or concept, especially when you get to the voluntary domain. It might be from compliance even perspective where there are certain regulatory standards that we need to meet, but from the voluntary space, it might not be as well, not just accepted, but understood. Looking back at your experience, how would you define ESD? And then if you were to distill it into a few pillars that have a very big impact uh, in terms of their building performance or whatever outcomes you're after, what, what would they be? Look, I think ESD is a tricky one to define because it is pretty nebulous. So we do sometimes include big sections of architecture and building science that may not belong. You know, where does condensation fit and building science, which is part of these things that sometimes are being wrapped into this role as an ESD consultant because you're specifying different types of materials inside an assembly and therefore intimately relating yourself to potential things like condensation and building science. But I think in terms of general categories of ESD, of energy and water and materials and indoor environment quality. We generally break up these targets or objectives mm -hmm. into these various categories across ESD and then address each of those. But I think it is generally going to be climate specific. As I'm saying before, up here in, in Queensland, I don't think that passive uh, solar design is as crucial as down south, whereas up here, appliances and PV in a residential context are perhaps more critical. We are having to target climate-specific problems. The condensation problem is going to rear its head down south before it raises its head up here. In terms of pillars, though, always being my objectives that we are aiming for zero carbon across our projects. There's various ways you could define what you mean by that, whether it's net zero emission or does it include embodied emissions and these kind of things. But that's a key one. Um, the building industry is one of those opportunities where we can do zero emission development. There's not many things in the world that can just suddenly switch off its impact, like 
agriculture, transport. We're not going to just turn that 50% of emissions from oil and transport to zero. It's very hard. Building industry is one of those opportunities where we can relatively easily through electrification and renewable energy and passive solar design, energy efficiency, all of these things. So we have to share the lion's load of going there, I feel, just personally. That was always a pillar in terms of targets, and we should be hitting net zero emission on most of our new projects. Materials and IEQ and building science, water, all of these other things, super important as well as people spending all of their lives inside or materials we're specifying. That's less my speciality in terms of material science and IEQ, but I also have a professional interest in the building science aspect of ESD, how we're designing good enclosures, assemblies, roofs, and have always tried to teach myself that aspect, which is becoming a more mature part of the discussion these days across the industry of people discussing permeability of sarking products and condensation and dew points, all of these kind of things. It's starting to become more mature. So I've always had a good interest in, in that sector too, but it's a very broad field. People can target different sections of those categories and deliver the best value they can for that specific project is generally how we took it back in the day. Thanks for breaking that down. You could go for hours on that alone, right? And each of those segments um, is an entire industry in itself. And now before we jump on to the software company we're working on, Hero, I'd be very keen to hear your outlook. What are you seeing in the industry at the moment, whether it's trends that are emerging or challenges or opportunities, maybe from an energy efficiency uh, perspective? In terms of what's in my brain at the moment, there are some reasonable regulatory changes on the horizon for residential energy efficiency and sustainability in terms of the National Construction Code for 2022. We might be seeing an increase from, you know, the six stars to seven stars. Also, whether this NATHERS rating, which has always just been about the thermal fabric, becomes a whole house rating that includes some services like your air conditioners or solar PV and all of those kind of things. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to shift the market quite strongly over the next few years, because if you're having to do it on every project, again, it takes that voluntary into a mandatory perspective and we'll start to see uh, more mature discussion around those kind of things. And one of the weaknesses of a mandatory system is that you only then forcing people to do what you've included. In terms of trends though, I think we're seeing what the industry itself in energy efficiency is maturing to discuss what are the problems that we're still yet to address. And disappointingly, I don't know if that's going to be addressed in the next iteration. So there hasn't been an, much advancement on some of the bugbears of the industry for you know ages is on air tightness and condensation, infiltration, mm -hmm. uh, thermal bridging, a few other things there. My personal opinion was you don't need to go from six stars to seven stars if you're still leaving a whole bunch of really important aspects outside of the scheme. Mm. So I would have preferred a six-star scheme that dealt with those than a seven-star scheme that then needs to somehow couple in, in the next iteration if they can. I think that was a missed opportunity there. People um, usually find a, a way to work around to get to those stars because the stars become the holy grail. It just seems crazy if you're having to do really, really good everything that's measured in your windows and your insulation, but whether that's the actual reality because of things like air tightness, thermal bridging, quality of install, penetrations is another story. Just you could have triple glazed windows and then still have some of these aspects and the performance would be you know, poor. Yeah. But we're, I think in the industry, you are seeing a maturity of discussion around all of those aspects. Everybody is talking about them. It's just haven't been brought into the scheme yet. So still in that kind of voluntary sphere of people pointing out that what you're about to build maybe won't perform as well as what you think it will build. I think we need to make people clear of that, that yeah, a seven-star home might not be a seven-star home unless you do X, Y, Z. Nice. And I think that gives us a nice segue into what you're currently working on, which is Hero. I'm always very curious about the story behind their names. So maybe a starting point is just a quick snapshot of what is Hero and a little bit of, of the story behind the name. Sure. Yeah, Hero Software is a company we founded about four years ago now to develop a new tool for the NatHERS energy industry and as a broader 
energy modeling tool to target some of these categories, you know, to bring tools to the ESG consultants and the architects and the engineers and the builders who have a demand for some of these aspects um, of sustainable design. HERO originally was an acronym. It was a, a service we even offered. It was Home Energy Rating and Optimization, the acronym, but we're just going as HERO now. It's a signal of our intentions that we're here for the right reasons. We do want to build tools to help the industry deliver great buildings and achieve those aims in terms of really sustainable outcomes. It's quite memorable as well. It's more memorable than the entire acronym spelled out. Yeah, that's right. And we were the first tool in this sector for 20 years, so it's a bit of new blood and a bit playful. Nice. Well, what's that like getting into a space that's uh, been dominated by other players for a very long time? It's interesting. Like when you're talking to someone and they're telling you that they've used one of the you know competitor tools for 20 years or they've been using it since even before its iteration, these are long life users of those platforms. And so it has been a part of our strategy of how do you address people who have been using something for so long? Mm. They can't imagine a different way of doing things sometimes and how to bring them across to your platform. You know, we're really conscious of that. We try not to, our, our kind of strategy has been to share a similar language and bring people into the Hero platform using similar language and features and then take them on our journey where we start doing things mm. quite differently and those kind of things. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a journey in itself. It is, yeah. The user yeah. journey. In the, yeah. It's all about yeah. transition. It's like how we've been describing energy modeling tools, which Hero is. It's a platform where you model your building, you describe its features and shading attributes and window geometries and types and, you know, very complicated kind of model of your building and you, you simulate it using CSIRO's calculation engine and you get the results and you analyze them and you tweak things and you do all that kind of stuff. It's not trivial. Mm -hmm. It's quite a science. It's complex and it's not just installing an app that takes photos off your phone or something we're not competing on there it's a bigger system than that it's quite a big program it's more of a migration and transition story than just install it and you're away but at the same time a lot of people find it very easy to use and that's part of the cornerstone of design and development mm. And maybe just taking a, a quick step back, what's been your experience and transitioning from consulting, which is largely service-based, to getting into the software space, designing and creating a product and bringing it into market? How has that experience been as a founder? It's been a long journey. We've started writing aspects and sketching out the designs of the interfaces four years ago for Hero. So it's been a long journey. I think we thought we'd be able to just get something out a lot easier. We certainly realised we were eating an elephant a few years in, but it's a different process. I find software design fascinating because it's got its own language and its own world. And this is the way we design software tools in the 21st century. This is what you should be considering and strategies and, of design. And and all of it. Yeah, that's right. And it's one of the points of difference we see for ourselves is that designing an app in 2021 versus in the late 90s or whatever, you're thinking about totally different approaches. Things like UX and UI, you know, user experience and user interface, these are specialities of their own now, like focusing on how the user in understands a tool, how they use tools and discover software tools, these kind of things. I find all of that a really fascinating part of the learning journey over the last few years is discovering best practice software development. Certainly when we are sketching these things out, it wasn't that. But yeah, in, in many respects, early on was a research project, like what mm -hmm. is this tool meant to be? What would it look like in my head? And why would anyone want to use something? What, what are the opportunities if we uh, sketch something out mm -hmm. um, for a new energy modeling tool? So those early years, we're trying to explore what our prototype or product would be and then after getting a bit of a proof of concept tool cleaning that up and getting it certified and ready for the market so super different to consulting dealing with multiple projects over much shorter time frames some clients might be a week some might be a year or something but it's not constant mm. and then suddenly you're singularly focused on one this one thing idea mm. dominates your head a bit too much and you can't think about anything else so 
<laughs> Sounds like quite a process because usually as a user, you get to interact with it when, when it's a finished product. You don't get to see the behind the scenes process that goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, it was also a professional retooling as a programmer, touching up my programming skills, trying to develop those um, skills and bringing on people to, to help us do that. So that's been, yeah, I always love, always been about learning myself. My satisfaction is always about learning something new. So that's been one of the nicer parts of the journey. Uh, and I think that comes across in the software as well, because based on the conversations I've had, especially with the younger energy raters, they do appreciate the, the UI, UX bit of Hero Software. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you're right about designing software in 2001 versus 2021. So thinking about completely different things, partly because all the apps that we're using as well, I think we, we, we have some form of expectation at the back of mind in terms of what the user experience should be like. Absolutely. Some of these tools are billion dollar companies who have spent a lot of time working out what people want researching. They found out what yeah. people actually need in terms of tools and that's flowing through to the rest of the industry. Mm. Uh, it's not like we have the budget to be asking thousands of people what they want for in an energy modeling tool or how they like buttons. It's a broader yeah, industry development. I suppose why we've focused on design and the app itself is that's the foundation from everything that we want to do to come. So you can have, you could be feature rich in a software tool. And you know, if, if, if they're not easily usable and they don't save you time and they're not well thought out and implemented, yeah, you can say you've got them, but they're not particularly handy. So we've certainly focused on more trying to control um, how we implement them well, because you could have two tools that from a feature deck look very similar and it doesn't tell the story. And maybe to expound on the, the snapshot that you've mentioned about Hero, what would you say is a big problem or what opportunity did you see in the market or gap did you see in the market that you're bringing on with Hero? There's so many. That was the reason <laughs> we wanted to do Hero because you know, software does have the power to do quite a bit and help mm -hmm. people out as tools in their work particularly in engineering where you're crunching numbers or analyzing. So there was a whole myriad that we've implemented some, got some on the agenda to come across a whole bunch of aspects of the tool and how it interacts with typical process of a consultant like yourself, like what they're doing out there and how we can support each of those stages in, in the tool rather than just features or whatever. So that's been a bit of a missed opportunity in the energy modeling market is how some of these tools relate to assisting with reporting, assisting with analysis and you know, evaluation of different options. For the get-go, we've been out on the market in a beta phase 10 months now, and that has predominantly about been about establishing ourselves just as a, the core of the product. And then some of these more innovative features are to come, but We've got some really big ones in the tool already. We always talk about our apartment modeling process. Apartments are now 40 or 50% of homes being built in Australia. And the process to do energy ratings for them was pretty awesome. kind of mind numbing. You had to do them all separately as separate files. It meant that you, were, you couldn't consider the building as a whole. And so one of the key features, and it's seminal in the data structure of Hero, is that we're a multi-dwelling tool. We can run hundreds of apartments in a Hero file and you get the whole apartment building in one go. You can run all of your apartments at once, change all of them at once, those kind of things. So given that's such a big part of the market and it was a big part of my consulting work by the end of my career there, that's one of our kind of more killer app features in terms of the optimization. Uh, a lot of where we want to go with this tool is help assisting with optimizing. If we can take away consultants spending time waiting for simulations to run or changing things just so that they can run another uh, scenario and evaluate those scenarios. Yeah, we feel like if we can improve efficiencies and save you guys a lot of time, you, you'll be freed up to deliver the most value, which is in that communication analysis, recommendations, that story with the client, rather than spending all of your time on running the simulation. Yeah. So mm. 
that's a big part of why we're aiming to be one of the fastest tools. We already have a lot of our users who love Hero because it's faster to create models, but that's all in that strategy of freeing you up from data entry to spend more of your time on what you're professionally trained to do to compare and make decisions and suggest recommendations, those kind of things. So that's mm. a big part of it for us. Nice. And maybe on a tangential note, have you had any unexpected events or observations since launching Hero to the market? What do you mean? So when you introduce a new product to the market, there's usually a vision that you have in mind, but sometimes you start to see observations of, oh, I didn't know that's what the users preferred or wanted or just something of that nature. I suppose a part of it has been, I'm a nerd who's used computers for all of my life since I was a kid and I'm very technically savvy and will always find shortcuts. And I suppose part of the journey has been also going, oh, actually, there's people nowhere near that kind of background and we need to cater to all types. Where two years ago, I was dismissive of adding a button because you could use the keyboard shortcut to get that. We need to be... This is part of that UX, UI discussion some of our staff bring to this party. We're delivering to all rather than just to nerds like me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably been a bit of my journey, knowing different types of users, how we can cater to each of those. And just if we were to take a picture of the moment in that broader vision that you have for the company, what would you say Hero is now? And as a follow-up, what will be the next steps? Sure. Despite it being a long development process, we still feel like it's, you know, really early days for us. As I said, we've been out on the market for public use for only about 10 months. And that was as a strategic decision. We'd been keeping a low profile during development because there were competitors who were developing another tool, which looks like it may not be going ahead. So we were trying to stealth through that process so they didn't get provoked into reaching market before us. And so we were aiming to try and get to market before them through that kind of strategy. But then this open beta, which is like a government accredited release, we needed that to be able to release a product. We needed it to get through the government regulation and testing and accreditation. But this beta period for us is about establishing ourselves in the market, building a bit of brand recognition over this early stage and testing out hero across hundreds of different platforms and different projects and it's very hard for a startup to imagine all the different ways that people can break the tool use the tool different projects these kind of things we're certainly feeling very confident about the tool now but 10 months ago there were a couple more bugs that we've resolved and so it was about minimizing any impact on people's business flows saying you might find something but we're just about to Uh, come out of that period with the next release Uh, it's a really big one for us I think they call it gold you know hero goes gold out of beta yeah and we can be a lot more confident that our platform is stable and I was talking to someone earlier about software almost needs to be perfect so you can work 99% of the time or 98% of the time it actually really needs to be 100% of the time and that's the tricky story so that's been part of this last 10 months but moving forward we're certainly scaling over the last six months we've been bringing on people to help out with this journey we've always had programmers working for us but fleshing out the rest of that team ESD consultants who can help me out on that ESD side of the development of Hero the training aspects of Hero and sales and marketing all of these kind of things and and scaling out our programming team at the same time yeah for us over the the short horizon we got lots of interesting things that we're working on like a mac version of hero is in the wings and we're looking forward to getting that hopefully out in the next three months or so some big new killer app features that we're keeping quiet on but I think some of these things will be real obvious. We're looking forward to getting, I I don't want to talk about them too much because you just, it's all talk. But when we integrate some of these big ones, it's going to be obvious where we're going with the direction of this and the value we're going to bring to the industry. But at the same time, I feel like we're delivering really good value for the product as it is. As a founder, you're always imagining where this thing can go. So you're never Mm -hmm. satisfied with where you are right now. Constantly making tweaks. Yeah, that's right. I think I'm always going to be thinking about how it can be better. So Mm -hmm. Looking forward to uh, seeing those killer apps coming in. Yep, cool. Maybe taking a a zoomed out um, approach. Because at the moment, you're in the energy rating space what would you say are some of the pros and cons of nuts as a whole 
mm-hmm. when you're talking about the six stars and seven stars, now that you're at the core of it, creating this software in that space, what are the shortcomings and what are the advantages mm-hmm. that Natas brings? We operate in this NetHERS field. It creates the market for us to exist as a commercial entity. I don't know if we always realize how complex and mature it is. There's a lot of countries that don't have anything like in that her scheme. A lot of countries will still rely on more fixed provisions and that can work in some environments. It works quite well in cold environments where you just set minimum insulation values on your you know, assembly because you're just saying it's always colder outside. All we need to do is super insulate and build airtight and we'll be half the way there. Mm. That's not the case for cooling where a lot of other complicated things come into effect and the balance of heating and cooling and that kind of stuff. So Mm. that's why an energy modeling approach makes sense for a country like Australia rather than fixed provisions. And that was always the opportunity that Nat has presented to the industry. This is your flexible approach for compliance rather than meet the fixed provisions of the code. Mm. Uh, That said, as long as what we're considering here is rigorous and accurate and holistic, that includes everything that should be measured and and Mm. analysed. And it is leaving a few off. And that's fine. I know they are looking at a whole bunch of those. We should probably be putting more pressure on them to get these things in. Certainly for 2025, it really should be some advancements in the scheme on uh, air tightness and thermal bridging and these things that are left out. Yeah, There is, at the moment in Australia, strong trends for the last few years to talk about Passive House, German rating tool. Mm -hmm. And I've done a few uncertified Passive House projects even seven years ago, and it was pretty evident doing that. It's not that far off from where we can take the NatHERS scheme. If you included those elements of thermal bridging, air tightness, a few other little bits and bobs, the NatHERS Mm -hmm. scheme starts to look a bit more like passive house and Mm. certainly again climate specific passive houses calculations which is the basis of their recommendations are in the cooling side of things are less rigorous than their heating side of things because it's easier to do i think we should really champion this uh, homegrown thing fix it up a bit better rather than adopt other aspects of international regulations i find personally the passive house thing is its arbitrary nature of some of its values are specifically derived from german conditions why it is 10 watts a square meter for the heating load and a few things like this and it's obvious if you build something with triple glazing and insulation walls and everything like that you're going to get um a great product but up here, certainly say Brisbane, I don't know if the average person would value that spend as, as easily as they'd think. Anyway, it's still a debate, obviously, but I would hope that we can just bring in those last remaining elements into the scheme. And then we're certainly not missing out on anything that Passive House is dealing with. So just tighten the scheme as it is at the moment. Yeah. By, by factoring in all these things that we are currently living out. Uh, by just concentrating on the building fabric. That's right. The other thing that Passive House does well is that it's got a verification aspect at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So do other tools. GreenStar moved to an as-built product and then even a operational rating where you make sure that building retains its claimed benefits. Mm -hmm. That's so important in terms of these net herd ratings are all very theoretical. We need to close the loop get that verification there or else who knows what's happening. There has been research that shows a lot of the time it is okay. I don't know if it's, you know, if you don't check, people are not doing it, but I think you'd pick up the worst cases as well if you force people to check some of these things. Mm -hmm. And you would also improve how it is implemented. If people are checking how well you build and insulate and deal with thermal bridges and Mm -hmm. someone looks at it and wants a photo of it, Mm -hmm. you know, your contractors and your tradies will think about it and, and deal with it. So that's probably the big aspect that Passive House has over NetHers at the moment is this verification aspect. Open-ended. Yeah, that's right. And we can be doing that voluntarily. Passive House is a voluntary thing there too. Rather than sign our clients back in the day up to achieve Passive House compliance, we were just trying to get our clients to do a blower door test at the end of their project, verify where it was and deal with 
what that says and mm -hmm. also do insulation inspections, demographic inspections, these kind of things. That's more for architectural end of town where people are paying for premium product and they want that sure that they deliver it. And then if you do that on every second project, it starts to make that whole service better in the industry for everyone else to just add on to we should be doing that voluntarily and we don't need other schemes to just have checklists of checking that what you've specified on that energy rating report is done is implemented yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and as, as we wind down i'd be curious to hear about how easy it is to translate the regulatory or the compliance requirements into software i like that question because it's painful it's trying to provide it in language that people can understand is difficult because it is complicated discussions, but some of it's specific to certain situations that means that you need to be some kind of specialist in NATHA's assessments to understand all the rules. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that about the industry as much. We should be having more ability to use these NATHA's tools and simulate their designs and, 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 and analyze their buildings better. But there's these NATHA's guidelines that are like it's sometimes a bedroom or a toilet should be conditioned if it has an openable window, not on this case. And it's those things that throw people a lot and probably why less building designers and architects and those people don't engage if the energy ratings as much as they used to, perhaps. So that's one of our aims is to try and make it understandable, provide that resource to people so that they can show alerts. If if something's gone against those guidelines, we try and alert our users to it so that they can understand. It's That's a tricky one for us because it's just so specific sometimes and yeah. frustrating in many respects there too, yeah. Yeah, and so to wrap up that section of the conversation, what would you say makes um, Hero stand out um, from the, the other players that are in, in this domain, the energy rating slash energy modeling deep domain? I, I think we're a energy modeling tool that's been developed by energy modelers who understand the outputs that we want from our tools, how we want to create our models, how we could create these simulations faster and the outputs and tools that we want within the, the, the platform. So that, that's the key aspect for us. We're experienced in this industry from a professional background, used a variety of energy modeling tools across the globe and taking bits from all of them and trying to create a, a new energy modeling platform for 2021 and beyond. A lot of energy modeling tools, Design Builder, IES, these old mature products that super powerful, but we're hoping to provide a yeah, different value proposition of easy to use, quick to use, and lots of integrations and these kind of things that software is in 2021. And suited for the, the, the Australian context as well. Yeah, sure. But look, we're trying to not lock ourselves too much into Australian context in mm. the end. You know, mm. uh, it's obviously our target market initially. And also, there's the commercial aspect of Australian energy modelling for commercial buildings and universities and those kind of things. We're, we're trying to develop a solution there, but then it shouldn't be hard for us to add in support for other countries too in the end. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. As a last question on a lighter note, are there any people or a specific person in the industry that you either follow or find insightful? Could be in the software space or the just energy efficiency property sector yeah there's a lots of people i admire in the industry despite all my comments on passive house i'm more engaging in that than critiquing it and so i do have a lot of respect for all of those people pushing that advanced building science approach to esd whether that be consultants or product manufacturers who are stepping up to enable us to hit those high performing standards i admire a lot of clients who are achieving some of these big aims in, in their projects. Like I had a close working relationship with Jeremy at Breathe Architecture, who I've got a lot of respect for, Nightingale Housing, which I see as a really interesting model for how apartment dwellings can be built. And it's across all of these categories that we were talking about earlier, but also other non-ESD related things of finance and social aspects and community. So yeah. Yeah, as much as we talk about technology all the time and energy modelling, homes are much more than just temperature modulating experiences. And so I like their approach to trying to also create community, but also hitting the targets that we all need. Nice. 
Uh, looking forward to catching up uh, again, maybe in a few months' time, just to hear more about the rollout of Hero Gold. I think it's going to be Hero 2.0. Sounds <laughs> great, Kelvin. Yeah, I'd love to chat further. And thanks a lot for your time. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thanks. No, great to have a chat. Thanks, Kelvin. Uh, cheers.